All right, you know, let's keep this really simple. There's not only okay. imports and exports in trade, there's imports and exports in policies, markets, conditions, mm -hmm. economic fundamentals. This morning, Chairman, the Germans auctioned off boons. Negative yielding for the first time since 2016. Is it no wonder that our rates continue to get pressured lower for many reasons, including but also outside the notion of our economy slowing? What do you think about negative rates and some of what's getting exported, not only from Germany, but Japan and China regarding policy and uh, economic weakness? Right. Well, Rick, as you know, because you live right there on the, on the floor, right, that our bonds are substitute for their bonds. And right now, our tenure is clearly responding to the negative news in Europe. And the news in Europe, the economic news, is really negative. If you look at industrial production, if you look at German GDP numbers, you know, three of the last five quarters are looking very close to, if not in, recession. Uh, Italy's got a lot of stress, and the whole Brexit thing is lurking over all that. And so if you had to say what's different this year from last year, you know, last year at this time, we were looking at a weak first quarter, expecting a strong second quarter, but the rest of the world was kind of doing a lot better. Uh, this year, we're looking at a weak first quarter. We still expect a strong second quarter and rest of the year. Uh, but the momentum from Europe and the momentum from Asia is much different than it was last year. And I think that that's what the bond market's responding to. You know, no matter how powerful an airplane you have traveling through the air, the winds coming at it are going to slow it down. And the more they pick up, the more it's going to exert headwinds. The U.S. economy has slowed a bit on its own. But the big question, Chairman, is how much is being exported to us as a headwind versus our own condition? And even if it's more overseas, what can we really do about it? I like the underpinnings of the economy, but there's little doubt that we're getting affected by our own coming off our best economic levels and much of Europe and Japan really going down the basement with regard to theirs. Right. Well, first of all, as you know, that since we have a big trade deficit, the, the feedback into the U.S. economy of negative news around the world is much smaller than it would be for, say, you know, a, a different uh, economy like, say, Germany, uh, where, where they really, really care about their exports to us. And if they were to go down because we were in trouble, it would really directly impact their economy. And so I think that basically for the U.S., the question is, as we look forward, uh, that are we more likely to have upside or downside surprises? And I think that the downside surprises really came over the last six months and involved the economies around the world. And there's not a lot more negative news that you know, could be worse than what, what we've seen in those places. But there's a heck of a lot of upside risk uh, in this year. And I think that that's one reason why equity markets have really been able to digest everything. And the upside risk is basically last year at this time, I think there was a lot more uh, pessimism about us moving forward with trade deals. But now we've got USMCA, uh, that, that can pass Congress this year. We've got uh, Secretary Mnuchin and Ambassador Lighthizer fly into China today with these ongoing negotiations. There's a lot of upside stuff uh, that could happen. Meanwhile, deregulation is uh, continuing to gather momentum. Uh, we're expecting a lot more deregulation this year. So I think that in the U.S., the risks are balanced to being actually leading on the upside relative to last year, and that the negative news around the world is something to factor in. Uh, but since you can think about things that could break the other way for us, that you should continue to be optimistic. No, and the things you mentioned are the tailwinds, and I am That's definitely right. on your side there. I think the regs, taxes, all that business-friendly administration, to me, is the biggest deal. And we saw that rally in stocks reflecting that even before Donald Trump was sworn in. But mm -hmm. we have to leverage more lifting but with regard to our domestic economy based on what's coming in. So I guess my next question is a simple one. That makes trade that much more important. And I think trade is outsized. I think that trade is the catalyst in so many areas that we're unaware of that should solutions be found, it'll really give us a turbo thrust. So my questions are simple. Some of the agreements, like you mentioned, that already done, is there going to be a problem pushing them through Congress? And more importantly, do you think that the China deal will include the trillions, not only the billions? Buying more grain is fine, but we really need to keep our eye on the big prize, and that's with a T, and that's IT. Look, look the, the going to China first, that our, our negotiators are on the ground. I don't want to get you know, too far out in front of them, but I, I can say that it wouldn't still be working if they weren't making a heck of a lot of progress, and it's not you know, just about one crop. It's, it's about 
fixing a relationship that's not really been successful. I think that as far as USMCA uh, goes, that really what's going to happen is that Congress is going to look at the details of the bill, the labor protections in Mexico, even things like really important things like ocean litter, agreements about, about limiting that. Uh, and they're going to think, you know, this is a really good deal that we've negotiated. It's the first 21st century trade deal uh, that America signed on to, really, with the, again, like the Internet agreements, the data protections and so on. So you so mean the same group in Congress that won't take Mueller at face <laughs> value is just going to vote? Well, we'll get into that in another time. Last week, the Treasury Department released February monthly deficit, $234 billion, the biggest monthly deficit in history. Now, I understand that you have to have deficits to seed programs that actually deliver in the future, but I want you to weigh in on deficits. Right. Well, I think that you know, we're, you're right that uh, the president's uh, first round was really to focus on the biggest problem, which was that we were the highest corporate tax place on earth and our regulations were advancing at a ridiculously high rate. And I guess the final thing is that, that our defense had been allowed to wither on the vine a little bit. And so he increased defense spending. He led a deregulation effort that we just documented in the economic report. The president actually cut paperwork costs for the first time that we could uh, find in recorded history. And he passed the tax cuts. But now, as, as we look forward, that you're right, that the deficit is a serious problem. And that's why the president's proposed across the board spending cuts of 5%. And I think that as we look forward to the debate this year over the budget, that we're going to really you know, stick to our guns and pursue a, a big reduction in government spending this year. You know, I guess another issue that I would like to bring up is when this administration wants lower rates, and I understand, I get it. Uh, we now see that overseas, keeping rates low and negative really hasn't made a huge difference. Is it really problematic for this administration, for its central bank to try to have some insurance for the next slowdown, a real slowdown, because we know somewhere out there there is one? Well, I know the president has had some uh, opinions about uh, what's going on at the Fed, but that's not my role at the CEA, really. And the, the one thing I can say is that We've appointed great folks over there to the Fed, and uh, you know I think we're continuing to. And I think that you know anyone who wonders whether we respect the independence of the Fed should look at the caliber of the people that we've appointed and feel reassured. You've been on record saying that you think we have a shot at three percent for the next several plus years. I think you That's may right. have said five, and I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you, but you're certainly in the minority. Can you right. give me something in real time that gives you confidence that your prediction will be correct? Yeah, sure. That if you look at uh, business sentiment, the National Association of Manufacturers just put out a survey where everybody's looking to expand and optimistic about this year. I mean, it was a first quarter number. And so the fact is that we've gone from a business unfriendly environment with regulations expanding 8 to 10 percent a year uh, and the highest corporate tax place on earth to a really attractive corporate tax environment with rapid deregulation. And so I think that, that that's not a one-year change. That's not just, you know, you're going to have a sugar high for a year and, the, and then go back to where you were. That's a fundamental change in an economy. And we should go back to you know, the way we used to be, where we were growing around 3%. And it's something that we saw last year, and it's something that we're going to see this year. And, and even while you've watched some of the numbers, uh, like in autos and, and, and construction, look a little weak in the first quarter, you've seen really, really strong wage and income growth. And that's, wage and income growth is the kind of thing that usually has a lot of momentum, right? It, because wages don't change that frequently. And to have high wage growth, high income growth right now, it's kind of like an insurance policy for strong growth this year. All right, you know, Chairman, I'm going to ask you one final question, whether you want to answer it directly or not. <laughs> Stephen Moore is being put forth potentially for the Fed. Uh, many like Stephen Moore, nice conservative economist. But talking about a 50 basis point cut, personally, once again, I know you're not going to talk about the Fed, but is it really wise to be saying these things if you want to be on the Fed? Conservatism on the balance sheet is a good thing, on policy is a good thing, but who knows what lies ahead? Your final thoughts. Right. Well, I, I think that as the process moves forward, if Steve ends up being the nominee, that he'll have good explanations for his positions. And I think that you're right that he's gone through his career being a pundit and, and having really interesting things to say about a whole range of topics. But as a nominee, that you have to be more careful about every little word that you utter. And I'm sure that he's going to start uh, you know, pulling back his op-eds and preparing for confirmation should that arise.